Good evening, brothers and sisters. We welcome you to the multi-stake missionary devotional. My name is Colin Clements and I've been asked to conduct this meeting. We welcome President Ellis, the Marion Stake President who presides at this meeting, and any other leaders who are viewing this devotional. We welcome also President Marquis, the Australia Adelaide Mission President, and we will hear from him later in the program. The opening hymn is High on the Mountain Top, and the opening prayer will be offered by Tiankum Varko of the Marion Ward. Thank you, Stay. Thank you for um, us coming here today for um, this devotional. And um, please, can we feel the spirit throughout this um, devotional? And um, we can all get something out of it and um, and um, learn. And um, in the name of Jesus Christ, Amen. The theme of this meeting is temple and family history work. Our first speaker this evening will be Declan 
Tucci of the Marion Ward. He will be followed by Amelia Clements of the Mount Gambier Ward, and then we will hear a musical item, I Love to See the Temple. When I was eight years old, my mum helped me set up my own family search account. I had watched my mum and grandparents just doing family history and telling stories, and I wanted to be involved and play a part too. I have always liked walking around in the cemetery with my papa. We would wonder about people's lives and we would explore the, and, and discover relatives who we have not met. When I was younger, my, my papa sent me a book that he had written about my great-great-grandfather, known as Grandad. I, I, it was a funny story that helped me to get, know, get to know Grandad a bit better. It reads, Grandad worked at the main post office in Sydney. He sorted letters to be sent to people. His work was near the market and he would buy fruit. One day, one, one day he had a watermelon that was not, not ripe. Grandad and his friends did not like the taste of the unripe watermelon. One of his mates threw it out the window. The window was on the second floor of the building. A horse flew in the day Davis Jones cart was passing by. The melon hit the horse on the head and knocked it out. Grandad always says that the driver is still wondering how his horse was knocked out in the middle of the road with a watermelon. This this story makes me laugh, and I, I like to think what it would have been like to be to be with, with Grandad. Would I have thrown the watermelon out the window? I think I would have. I like to go on family search and look for stories about my ancestors. I especially like to look for photos and help them fix them up. When I add photos to their names on family search, I feel like I've, I feel like they have a face now. I feel more connected to them as a person rather than just a name and date. I've found photos on ancestry that my nana had not seen of her grandfather. It makes me feel happy to be able to make that personal connection. One day I was looking at a photo of Grandad and realized that I had a dream that he was in them. I had never seen his photo before, but I have a clear memory of him in my dream. Mom thinks I have a connection to him because we are similar, and he is looking after me. Next year, I will be able to go inside the temple to perform baptisms on behalf of my ancestors, who did not have a chance to be baptized while they were alive. My great-great-grandfather, Domenico Antonio Tucci, is one person who I will have the opportunity for. I remember my baptism and how happy I was. My, my, smile, my smile was so big, big, I felt like my jaw would come off. I had lots of family from Sydney and Melbourne come to visit to be part of my baptism because they knew how, how important this day was for me. I did not want to wait, so I baptized was baptized on my 8th birthday. I wonder how Domenico will, will feel as I go to the temple to be baptized for him. Will he have a big smile like me and have lots of family gathering for his moment, for this moment? Is he also eager that like I was to be baptized and not want to wait? I am glad that I can play a part in helping him to be baptized. In the name of Jesus Christ, Amen. Good evening, brothers and sisters. Today I've been asked to talk to you about getting to know my ancestors through family history research and temple attendance and how it has strengthened me. I am 13 years old now, but the first time I went to the temple was when I was 11 and I got to do baptisms for the first time in the Sydney temple. I went with my cousin Aria, who was a couple weeks older than me, and so we entered the temple together. We did family names and the tr that experience was special and meaningful for both of us as it was our first time actually in the temple. Before you go to the temple though, you can get names of family members to take. You do this through family history. I used to do family history with my nanny, my grandmother, in Canada. I used to sit and watch her or help her sometimes and was found and always found it very interesting. After a while, she helped me make my own account and set it up and I continued family history, doing family history myself, asking her for help whenever I needed it. Over the years, every time I visited the temple, I always try to find some family names that I can take. 
The second time I went to the temple was in Adelaide the next year because my cousins, Asher and Kobe, were being advanced in the priesthood and could do baptisms. Asher and Kobe both did some of the baptisms and Asher baptized me for a few of them. This was a special visit as well to the temple and you could feel how special it was to all of us who were there. The third time I went to the temple was in South Africa, Johannesburg. My dad and I got up early and went into the temple. We were waiting to go to the baptistry when a lady came up to us and asked if, because we were doing baptisms, we could do hers for her as she could not do her own. We said yes and did her baptisms as well as our own. This particular experience strengthened me because I knew that I was helping my ancestors and helping someone else's ancestors as well. All my experiences have helped me to realize how important family history and temple attendance is. It has helped me to strengthen my testimony in certain ways. It has also helped me to understand and learn about my ancestors. It has helped me to see the importance and the rewards in doing family history and going to the temple regularly. It helps me to feel closer to my living relatives when we do family history together and go to the temple together. It also helps me feel closer to my ancestors as I help them as well. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. The next speaker this evening will be Chantelle Black of the Mount Barker Ward. She will be followed by Sister Christine Hutchins of the Victor Harbour branch. Following Sister Hutchins, we will view a video presentation uh, by Elders Bednar and Rasban. Good evening, brothers and sisters. My mission president asked me to set goals in five categories at the conclusion of my mission to prepare me for coming home. 
Those categories were education, career, physical health, spiritual progression, and temple marriage. I found it quite easy to set goals for the first four categories, but on reflection, I found myself setting for temple marriage goals that were far from worthy. I found myself working on getting a license, I found myself going on a lot of dates, uh, and while not worth less endeavours, looking back it wasn't strengthening me or helping me in a meaningful way to prepare for marriage. Uh, instead, I've discovered that the fifth category doesn't exist, but rather the category is temple marriage. The rest of them are just branches of it. And the reason that I can say this with confidence is because when setting goals for education, I would ask myself, is this going to help me raise a righteous family? When setting goals for spiritual progression, I would reflect on why I went to institute. It was to learn and to build uplifting relationships <coughs> with boys. Um, but when we begin with the end in mind, we realize that the end goal of returning to live with our Heavenly Father, our family, in His family, our everyday decisions cannot stay the same. That goals do not allow for casual or careless decision making. When that is our goal, every action we take brings us closer to Christ. I've been baptized, I've received the gift of the Holy Ghost, I've received my endowments, and I've been sealed in the temple to a worthy priesthood holder, my eternal companion. And so now I find myself just needing to endure to the end. But really, what I'm doing now is making sure I'm living the covenants I've made every day. And that's how I prepared for temple marriage. The parable of the talents is a great one to reflect upon. Three men were sent to earth, one with one talent, one with two talents, one with five talents, and they were told to go forth and share their talents. The one with one decided to bury it in the ground so that he wouldn't lose it, and the ones who had multiple talents decided to go out and use them to increase. And at the end of the day, the Savior came to them and said, Why have you buried your talent in the ground? I gave it to you for you to grow. And so every part of me that is good that I have from the Savior, I can use through other people to grow and to love who he was. My husband is a great example of a Christ-like man. And now that I'm married, my goal hasn't finished. Rather than trying to be the person that I would want to marry before marriage, I get to try and be the person that I would be married to. So if I want my husband to be loving and supportive, then it's my job to be loving and supportive. If I want him to help me keep a clean house, then I have to help us keep a clean house and so forth. It's daily improvement. It's knowing that the efforts we put forth are meaningful. In Galatians chapter 6 verse 9, it says, And let us not weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. So for all of you YSA who are still in effort, married, make it a daily decision to be your best self, to improve, because when we are well doing, if we stay not weary, then we shall reap. And it's definitely not going to help you go out and get married in a week or in a month, because the timing is still very much up to the Lord. But be ready for it. By being your best self today, by being the person you would want to marry, I just want to finish by sharing a quote by Jeffrey R. Holland. 
He said, God doesn't care nearly as much about where you have been as he does about where you are and, with his help, where you are willing to go. And I'd like to share my testimony that Jesus Christ will help us to achieve our righteous endeavors. I love him and I say this in his name, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Good evening, brothers and sisters. I would like to talk a little about my joy in doing family history. We as a family joined the church many years ago, and until then I'd never considered family history, that people could be sealed for time and all eternity. So when I found that this was possible, it held, opened a whole new dimensions to me. Having a temple recommend and I could go to the temple, I decided that I would try doing it. As sometimes it takes months, weeks, years in fact, to find the family that is needed and all the information. But in my case, quite recently, I had a sister that had got eight children and no husband. And I thought, this can't be right. So I got onto the 1831 census and found. <laughs> got all the information and they are now happily sealed together. Um, with that, I have a paternal grandmother who I love very dearly. And she died at the age of 103. Her husband had died a few years earlier. And so I thought I'd seal them together. I did. And she let me know I know in certain terms that this is what she wanted and she was happy. But no, it didn't end there. She has, or they had, five sons and two daughters. And she wanted me to seal each one of her children to them as a family. So bit by bit I found the information and each time I sealed one, she let me know that she was happy. But she kept pushing me, they weren't all done. And then my father was the last to die. And I sealed him to her. There, her family was complete and she was happy. So I thought, well, I may as well join my father and my mother together for time and all eternity. I did this and I had confirmation very strongly that this is what they wanted. And then I thought, well, I've joined all her children to her. I'd better join their spouses to them as well. So this I did again. And I can't tell you that I truly felt an excess of joy with each one of them. Some of them I did, but that's not to say that they didn't accept the gospel. And then, uh, a few months ago, I found a, a relative that, um, in England, and she sent me lots of information about my great-grandparents. Some of them I had done, others I just couldn't find the info I needed. She sent it, I got it, and all together with that were plenty of photographs. I was just so thrilled to have all this work to do. And then two weeks ago, on my husband's side, on the Hutchings side, I had a lot of photographs come through from the Hutchings. It's work I had done, but the memorabilia I needed. So, brothers and sisters, this is just a really worthy thing to do. I am so interested and happy and joyful to do this work. I go to the temple with my names and my cards all ready to do. Now, if for any reason you don't have a temple recommendation yet, have names to be done, then please speak with the people that do have, and they will take them to the temple for you. And if you have temple recommends and don't have anyone, then go because the temple file is always there and there's plenty of work always to do. Brothers and sisters, this is the only church that spoke of Jesus Christ the Latter day Saint on the earth this day. It is the only true church and the only one where we can be sealed with our families for time and and all eternity in our temples is secret. And I say this most humbly in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you for your interest in temples. Members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints declare that a temple is literally a house of the Lord. Each temple is a holy sanctuary in which sacred ceremonies and ordinances of the gospel are performed by and for the living and also in behalf of the dead. The church builds temples all over the world. You may have seen one in your community. They are beautiful, holy houses of the Lord. 
We build temples so our faithful members can visit often and receive the most sacred ordinances of our faith. Before our temples are dedicated for their sacred purpose, the public is invited to see the beauty of the temple and learn about the commitments we make there with God. I invite you now to enjoy this video and see inside one of our temples. In this recording made in the Rome, Italy temple, you will hear from two apostles of the Lord about promises devout members make there to become better people by following our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Hello, and welcome to the House of the Lord. My name is David Bednar, and this is Ronald Rasban. We both serve as members of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. We are here in the Rome, Italy temple, and we're delighted that you can join us for this brief tour. This is the recommend desk of the temple. Members of our church come here to this recommend desk, and they're met by two temple workers who are wearing white suits and they present a small card called a Temple Recommend. The card is issued by their local church leaders affirming that they are prepared to participate in these sacred ceremonies of the Temple. Now please notice how immediately as you enter the Temple, the focus is on the Savior, represented in the painting behind me and in the other artwork that you find throughout the Temple. Welcome to the Baptistry of the Temple. This room houses the baptismal font, and one of the very first things you'll notice is that the font sits upon the backs of 12 strong oxen. Those oxen represent the 12 tribes of Israel, and they also represent the strength and the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Savior said, except a man be born of the water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. Baptism by immersion for the remission of sins is an essential saving ordinance in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And here in the temple, we do baptisms for the dead. Two members of our church will come into the baptismal font dressed in white, and there they will be baptized for their departed ancestors. Baptism for the dead was taught by the Apostle Paul in the New Testament and we have the privilege of continuing that ordinance in the church today in all of the temples throughout the world. One of the great questions in Christianity is what happens to those who have never heard of Jesus Christ? His is the only name under heaven whereby a man or a woman can be saved. But yet among all those who have ever lived, only a relative few have heard of him, have had the opportunity to learn his doctrine, and to receive the saving ordinance of baptism by immersion. That is made possible through proxy baptism for the dead. There are some people who will ask if we are compelling or constraining our ancestors to become members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And the answer is no. It is a loving offering, and they then have the opportunity to accept or reject that ordinance. When a person comes to the temple to perform baptisms for the dead, he or she would come to a dressing area like this, separate area for the men, separate area for the women. This is what the lockers look like, and you would dress in this kind of clean white clothing. An ordinance is a sacred religious ceremony. This is one of the instruction rooms of the temple. Here we begin the endowment. The word endowment represents a gift of light and of power to those who come here and receive this sacred instruction and honor their commitments. In this instruction room, we learn about the plan of happiness, and we learn about God's purpose for us here in mortality. We're also able to make special covenants with the Lord about our journey throughout life. A covenant is a pledge, a promise, and a commitment to God. And here, as a part of the endowment, we pledge that we will obey God's commandments, that we will be selfless, that we will live clean, pure, and chaste lives, and that we will develop and dedicate ourselves to God's holy purposes. 
We have just come from the first instruction room where the walls were painted in beautiful murals of the world we now live in. We have progressed into this instruction room now that is lighter, brighter, and gives us a sense of our progression through life. That progression is made possible because of honoring the covenants that we entered into in the previous instruction room. You'll notice that there's also an altar in this room. These altars are an essential element of the process of entering into covenants with God. Now we'll move into the celestial room, representing the ultimate destination of our eternal journey, back to the presence of our Father in heaven. The celestial room of the temple is a representation of our heavenly home, the ultimate destination of our mortal journey. The celestial room is also a place of personal, private prayer, reflection, and meditation. We're in the ceiling room of the temple. The word ceiling can be equated to a marriage that is forever binding or put together permanently. At this altar, a man and a woman kneel, take each other by the hand, and by the authority of that holy priesthood power, they are sealed as a husband and a wife. And if they are true and faithful to the covenants that they have entered into in the temple, then that marriage lasts not just till death do they part, but for all of eternity. This great power connects all generations as children and parents can also be sealed together as families for eternity. I love coming into this room. It helps me remember what it was like when I was a new bride here in the temple. And I remember the hopes and the dreams that I had, the excitement that I felt, and the love that we had for one another. Every once in a while, when we have a misunderstanding or a disagreement, I like for my mind to come back to the temple and remember those things I felt on our wedding day. And then it helps put things into perspective. Something that seems big becomes small and insignificant. And I remember that we're married, not only for this life, but forever. All that we have discussed today, all that we have attempted to show you is focused on Christ. And because of Him and His atoning sacrifice, the work that is performed in the holy temples endures now and throughout all of eternity. With all the energy of my soul, I declare His living reality, His divinity as our Savior, and I do so joyfully in the sacred name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen. We would like to thank all those who have participated in this devotional this evening. Our final speaker will be President Mark Key, the Australia Adelaide Mission President. Our closing hymn will be Beautiful Zion Built Above, and the closing prayer will be offered by Sister Lily Williams of the Mount Barker Ward. Thank you. Good evening, brothers and sisters and friends. I'm grateful to President Ellis for his kind invitation to be with you tonight and to share a few concluding remarks at the end of our multi-stake devotional. Over the last few months, we've been impacted by the COVID-19 coronavirus, and we can quickly think of many ways that we've had difficulties or inconveniences in our lives but certainly the tragic loss of life and the millions upon millions of people around the globe that have been uh, infected with the virus, that comes to mind and weighs heavily on all of our hearts. But for those of us that have been blessed to remain relatively healthy during this time period, our minds might go to all of the other ways that we've been negatively impacted. Uh, for me, I think of border closures, I think of travel restrictions, of quarantines, uh, maybe employment or other economies 
uh, collapsing and, and maybe some things that have been particular to your family that not everybody else has uh, experienced, but, but there have been a lot of things that have occurred during this coronavirus time period. But as we gather together tonight, I recognize that we have members of the Church of Jesus Christ, as well as friends of members that have been invited to participate tonight, as well as missionaries and their friends participating with us throughout all of South Australia and including the Northern Territory. We actually have friends joining us tonight as far north as Darwin, and we welcome them and are grateful that they're here. Perhaps this is one of the positive outcomes, if I can be so bold as to refer to a positive outcome from this pandemic. Uh, and, and that's that we have become expert at learning how to connect to one another via technology. Just a few months ago, many of us had never even heard of Zoom. Uh, we maybe had heard of Facebook Messenger or Skype, but even those of us that had heard of these technologies really didn't know how to use them all that effectively. But today, because of the pandemic, we've become expert at learning how to connect just as we're doing tonight with people across the continent, across the city, maybe across our families, and in our case with Sister Marquis and I across the world as we communicate with our children and our grandchildren. It's become so commonplace, in fact, that we're becoming somewhat of technological experts when it comes to connecting with one another. So as I think about what we're talking about tonight in our uh, devotional, I see a parallel to what's happening during the pandemic. This idea of using technologies to connect with one another, it's very similar that as we are learning to do family history research, that we're connecting through technology from generation to generation with our ancestors. Indeed, what used to be done with a paper and pencil is now being done through the technology of a mouse and a computer. We all know that family history is a, a way of connecting generations together. We've talked about that tonight. We invite you to learn more about how you can set up your own free account, if you don't already have one, accessing the world's largest database of names and genealogical records. It's called Family Search. It's owned by the church. It contains billions and billions of records and it's free of charge. And if you don't already have your own account, we invite you to reach out to whoever invited you or reach out to another member of the church if you're already a member. And we have volunteers that are ready to help you, that this is what they do. They love genealogical and family history research and they would love to help you. But for the next few minutes, as I conclude uh, my remarks with our devotional this evening, I'd like to talk to you not so much about how to do family history, but to continue the theme of why. Why is this so important to us as members of the Church of Jesus Christ? In the simplest of terms, it's because of our strong faith in the eternal nature of families. We do believe that families are forever. We believe that families can be forever when we're sealed together, sealed to one another in special temple ceremonies through ordinances. For those living in South Australia and the Northern Territory, we've been blessed to have one of these temples right here in Adelaide. And four other temples spread throughout the continent in the major population centers of Australia. It's in these temples where sacred ceremonies are conducted where families are connected for the eternities. Not only are ceremonies or ordinances performed in these temples for those of us that are living, but we can also perform these ordinances in behalf of our ancestors who have passed on prior to us. For this reason, we're encouraged to research our family histories to find those that are lost and to learn more about our ancestors and their lives. We do not believe that life ends at death, but rather that through the atonement and the resurrection of our Savior, Jesus Christ, and through our Heavenly Father in his great plan of happiness, his plan of salvation for each of his children, that the family unit will continue beyond the grave. In addition to temple ordinances, family history research also fulfills the last prophecy in the Old Testament. 
the prophet Malachi at the very end of your Old Testament, the very last verses at the very end. In chapter 4 of Malachi, verses 5 and 6, he said, and I quote, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children's to their fathers. Knowing about one's ancestors, it strengthens this connection between generations, both past and future. I'm reminded of a quote from the author Alex Haley. Some of you may remember of his best-selling book titled Roots and the subsequent television series that came out in the 1970s. In this book's book, Alex Haley, he told the story of one of his ancestors, a gentleman by the name of Kunta Kinte, who was in the 18th century an African from Africa, and he was sold into slavery and then transported to the United States. And this research that Mr. Haley did about his ancestors, it followed the life of Kunta Kinte and his descendants all the way down to Alex Haley. At the end of this journey, this process that Mr. Haley went through of doing this genealogical research, he said something, and I'll quote this, it was profound. He said, in all of us, there is a hunger, marrow deep, to know our heritage, to know who we are and where we have come from. Without this enriching knowledge, there is a hollow yearning. No matter what our attainments in life, there is still a vacuum, an emptiness, and the most disquieting loneliness. In reality, though, I think what Mr. Haley discovered was the fulfillment of the promise of Malachi's prophecy that the hearts of the fathers would turn to the children and that the hearts of the children would turn to their fathers. Brothers and sisters, I testify to you in closing tonight that Jesus Christ lives, that we have a loving Heavenly Father. We are His children. There is purpose in our life, and He has a plan for each of us, even a great plan of happiness that includes eternal families. You can learn more about this plan of happiness of which we teach in the Book of Mormon or by talking to the missionaries or to the member of the church that invited you here tonight. I can't, I truly cannot think of anything that I would wish for more than to be sealed, to be bound and bonded to my sweet bride and to our children and our grandchildren and our parents and our grandparents for time and all eternity. Nothing could be sweeter. My prayer is that you will experience this same yearning of which we've spoken of tonight that Alex, Alex Haley spoke of and that the prophet Malachi prophesied of and that your heart will turn. And I share these thoughts with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
Dear Heavenly Father, we're grateful for this beautiful day. We're grateful that we could have listened to all these inspiring words and we're truly grateful for the opportunity to have um, the electronic um, um, capabilities to uh, um, have this devotional, multi-state devotional. Heavenly Father, we're truly grateful for um, all the wonderful speakers and please bless them for the efforts that they have put in, Heavenly Father. Um, please help us as we go um, throughout. The, um, remember family history and um, the blessing of temples that we may be able to imply it in our lives and teach others about it, Heavenly Father. We love thee and we're so grateful for the gospel and we're grateful for the safety of Adelaide and at this time and grateful for all the um, preparation that has gone into this and um, we're truly grateful for everyone that has attended and we love thee and we're truly grateful for all our leaders and the prophet and we say these things in the name of thy son Jesus Christ, Amen. Thank you.